Love Talk Radio. Yesterday and 
The host over there, Rob Steele, is excellent as well. Shout out to the happy hour as well because Todd came through and held it down on the flagship. Uh, it was just a great time. We talked about a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about tonight, you know, but uh, it was good to represent Barbershop Sports. So shout out to them and uh, all our other partners, XRP, uh, Excite Radio, you know how we do every week, showing love and thanking everybody and shouting out the whole Barbershop Sports Nation, f Bomb, the Oracle, Gary from Greensboro, all that. You know what I'm saying? We all in the building, and it's time to make things happen. But before we finish up complete church business, Barbershop Sports is 100% independent, and because of that, we network with our independent uh, uh, artists out there, and push their music out to to you know like we say we you know we're playing all over the world now so we give the artists a chance to to get their music out through our uh, uh, show and I was blessed with a whole bunch of indie tracks and I was listening to all of them listening to all of them and I say you know I'm going to give this group called Harlan Simple out of VA some burn so Harlan Simple you probably didn't know that you was going to get burned on the Barbershop Sports Show, but you're about to get burned. The, the name of the song I love is called Codeine and Cognac. It put me in that southern state of mind. So without further ado, here's Codeine and Cognac, and then we get into this Jamis Weston and some crab legs, baby. We'll be back in a second. talking about right there harlan with an n like nancy not harlem harlan simple is the name of that band 
Uh, you can find them on their home, www.harlensimpleband.com. They're also on Facebook under the same name as well. And they jam all over the country. Uh, you go to their website, you can pull up their, their press kit and get a little bit more uh, background if you uh, enjoy what you heard. I hope you did. I mean, the name of the song is Codeine and Kanye. How could you not? I mean, that's like one of the most pimp combinations in the world, Big Danny. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you got codeine and you got cognac, you're probably going to be feeling pretty good, brother. That's all I'm saying. And, That's all I'm saying. It also makes for a hell of a party, too. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yeah, man. So, Barbershop Sports Nation, it's time to talk about famous Jameis. And we had to make an adjustment because we was going to jump right in, just so you know. We were going to jump right in to, to this NFL draft because it's right around the corner. And we go, we are going to get into it in, in detail. But, you know, when you hear about one of the most famous athletes in college football today, college sports, period, a Heisman Trophy winner, a national championship winner, Gets busted for theft of what you say? Did he? Would he steal a car? Did he rob a bank? What, what did he do? No, he stole some crab legs and crawfish, and and not just you know a, a couple of crab legs and crawfish. Thirty-two dollars and seventy-three cents. <laughs> yes, that's right. Thirty-two dollars and seventy-three cents worth of crab legs and crawfish. And as a result of him getting busted, walking out of Publix grocery store with $32.73 worth of crab legs and crawfish, he is suspended from the baseball team. b Ride doesn't get any more embarrassing for getting busted for, for crab legs and crawfish, brother? Close. I mean, I, <laughs> I think what would have been a little more embarrassing, you know, here maybe shove a live lobster down his pants or something and try to walk out <laughs> the store or something like that. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's bad. I mean, and he just pretty much flat out said, yeah, he forgot to pay. I mean, I don't know how he can go and <laughs> grab some items from any store. I don't care if it's, you know, a little corner bodega or, you know, a big grocery store and walk in and grab some food and then just walk out. Oh, I forgot. Like, <laughs> it's absolutely absurd. Um, it's man, he's been getting some red flags around him before. You know, you would think he would lay low and and not right. draw any more attention to himself. And he goes and he and he does another stupid thing like this. I mean, I know he's still young, but come on, you know the difference between right and wrong. And, you know, the difference between going to the store and buying something, going to the store and just taking it and walking out. I mean, he, he's old enough to know that. I know he's young, but, jeez, he's old enough to know that. Come on. It's ridiculous. Yo. <laughs> Big Danny, man. Help help me help me out because I think you was the one in, earlier that broke it to us, you know, about what happened. Help me out with this, man. I mean, this guy is – Tallahassee, you probably can spit across it. It's, it, it's, it's that small. You you know, you're the most famous face in Tallahassee right now, outside of, you know, Bobby Bowden and a couple of those other former uh, FSU greats. And, and you, you think you can just walk in Publix and, and, and walk out like nobody knew what was going on? Danny, help a brother out. Help the barbershop sports nation out with that, as a matter of fact. You know, the funny thing was I, I was at work when I got the message that Jameis was arrested. So I was like, okay, what did he get arrested for? And then he said, you got arrested for shoplifting at Publix. So I'm thinking, you know, college student, you know, myself, you know, I've been in college before. I understand how rough it is we don't have any money. But when it sounds like he was taking crab legs, I'm thinking, man, I didn't eat crab legs I turned 25. You know, you're a 20-year-old <laughs> kid, <laughs> and you go out to Publix and you take crab legs. At least he wasn't shoplifting oodles and noodles. So, you know, he wasn't getting top ramen. You know, it, 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 I take away all the funniness out of it. You know, this is just a proven case, another case of what Shabazz Napier was talking about. You know, these kids are hungry. They don't really get much food. And you know what? 
for Jameis Winston to go around the, the city of Tallahassee and guarantee you probably see a whole bunch of kids wearing his jersey, and he has to shoplift crab legs just to have dinner. Now, his excuse to the police, uh, I'm not buying. I, I don't buy it. He said that in a statement, I went to a supermarket with the intent and purchase uh, to the purpose to purchase dinner, but made a terrible mistake, which I'm taking full responsibility. In a moment of youthful ignorance, I walked out of the store without paying for one of my items. So my question for you is, is was he, did he pay for the Old Bay and, and the juice they were drinking afterwards? <laughs> I mean, what did he pay for? Did he? I mean, did he have like, a, you know, some Red Bull and, you know, a two liter of Coke that he, he bought, but he forgot that the crab legs and crawfish in the other bag? That he needed to pay for that too. I I was just trying to, you know what, Barbershop Sports Nation, you know, we out here live. We seven six four six seven two seven one nine six three. What was famous Jameis thinking when he walked out of the store with the crab legs and the crawfish? Other than he was about to get his grub on, you know. Obviously, he was thinking that because I ain't almost like I live in Florida. I have sampled Puss's crab legs, and I will tell you they are www to make you slap somebody. The only thing they made him do was get some 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 uh, handcuffs slapped on him, you know. So I just need somebody out there to help us understand what's going on with these kids today. Because hey. look, man, I'm from the old school, Big Ted. Look, if I'm playing with Jameis, I know they got look as they say around the way. The thirst is real. And I know they got a lot of thirsty women in Tallahassee trying to get on that million dollar train. You mean yes, tell them of them couldn't boil them some crab legs, Ted? I heard he was. Um, and Danny, I, I understand your sources. And, and B. Rye, I understand your point of view and, and has your overarching view. But <laughs> here's what I heard. I heard he was doing a price comparison between Win Dixie and Publix, oh. and. <laughs> He can get the best price. He's trying to see where he can, which store. <laughs> he can get the best price for for nine dollars a pound. Of what? Crap. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? Oh my god! You know what? I mean, I already got a big dummy loaded up. You know, <sighs> for 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 later. But you know, you think about that that this tag that people get in this country. When stuff like this happens, you know, B. Rye, the uh, athlete's worst nightmare is the tag character issues, brother. I mean, that takes you from multi-million first round to dropping late in the first round. It depended on you know if these character issues continue. Man. Yeah. Now you've gone from, from, from millions to, you know, a couple hundred thousand. Was yeah, it worth I mean, it? I, I hope those are the best damn crab legs he's ever had in his life. <laughs> <laughs> My God. You're, My. you're talking about two fronts here, too. I mean, he's also a prospect in baseball. Exactly. Um and not only just football, but, you know, baseball. And, it, 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 you know, baseball a little bit more, you could take a gamble and, and not lose out on it as much. But football, I mean, we see now, especially with the extra two weeks now in the draft, of how much is going into the draft. I mean, teams are ready to draft, but now they're just going back and they're checking everything. You go through, you know, you meet with uh, – Everybody, they analyze how you answer your questions. They look into everything into your past. And I mean, he, he had the, the rape allegations, and that was dropped. But you know, it still it still will bring up you know a small red flag, even though it's being dropped. Um, just being you know in that type of situation, fair or unfair, but there's still it's something you got to look at if you're going to invest millions of dollars into something or someone. And now you got this incident of just plainly walking into the store and walking out. And, you know, there's, there's been other smaller incidents um, with him just, I don't know if he has a sense of entitlement. You know, there's the whole, um, I mean, it's stupid, but it's the, the Burger King incident. We went there to ask for water and then just kept taking soda. And 
before you kept exactly. yelling at him, he's kind of brushed them off. So, I mean, it's, it goes into the character issue of, you know, of him having a sense of entitlement and just, you know, I'm I'm famous Jameis Winston. I, you know, I do what I want. <laughs> like it kind of reminds me of a, of an episode of uh, Real Husbands of Hollywood, man, where Chris Rock was, was try, trying to show Kevin Hart the difference between what a Hollywood star how they live, and how Kevin Hart lives. And Chris Rock was just going into jewelry stores, man, putting on watches and walking clean, smooth out, man. Nobody was telling him nothing. You know, he walked out in the middle of the street. A dude was uh, driving a Ferrari. He said, hey, man, I need to borrow this Ferrari, man. I'm Chris Rock. Dude got right out the car, gave it to him. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I guess that's what Famous James thinks. That, that's the level he's on, B-Rock, you know. Hey, man, hey, can I, let me borrow your car, man. I'm Famous James. Hey man, let me let me let me chill with your girlfriend for the night, man. I'm, I'm famous, James. Hey man, let me get that bag of Skittles, man. That's all good. I'm famous, James. You know, and it's no, brother. <laughs> That's not so, how it works. He's one, of, he's one of those people you see that go into the store and they'll like you know grab soda and drink it around, looking around the store. You know, a lot of people pay for it. You yeah, yeah, yeah. Keeps on, keeps on going. Goes over, grabs the Snickers. He said, throws the rapper away, scout out the seafood, see what's going on there. <laughs> I mean, you know, just oh. taste a sample of everything. Man, know, man, man. Hard, it's hard to say. Like, you hope, you know, with the last sentence, that was a wake-up call to, you know, start acting right. You're under, a, you know, such a, a national spotlight. And now, you know, you go and <laughs> do something else stupid. So, I mean, he, I, you know, I would have thought the last one would have been a wake-up call, but obviously that wasn't. So I, I don't know <laughs> what it's going to take to get this, you know, young man, uh, you know, to, to really, what he has to do is grow up and just, you know, uh, Dude, do, do you right survive? Thing. Everybody you survive. I mean, really, really? ordinary jobs do the right thing every day. Not yes. that hard. Yeah, I mean, be right. Let's see. I mean, this is the barbershop, man. Truth be told, we shouldn't even be talking about this guy, not because of this incident, but we shouldn't be talking about him because of the last incident. You know, that's that's pretty much career suicide, right there. To even have your name associated with that. I mean, you you're looking at. Uh, Colin Kaepernick in, in the professional world, what he's dealing with with those those uh, allegations out of Miami, and it, it's just been a witch hunt for that brother. Now whether he did it or not, that remains to be seen. But you don't, that's just you don't do it. You got Darren Sharper right now, you know, just they're coming out the woodworks. You know, DNA Sally is just going down for him. His his plane is crashing, and you ain't even made one NFL dollar yet. And, you know, you survive that, and then you keep going. So, you know what? I'm not going to beat this dead horse, America. I, you know, it's a barbershop, so we had to put it a little through the spend cycle. I mean, Ted told you it was a price comparison. I'm just, like, trying to understand the whole thing. You know, Big Danny broke down his angle, and B-Rod broke down his, man. And, and without further ado, B-Rod, you know what? I wasn't going to hit him with the regular big dummy, but because this is, like, extra special, I mean, he's an extra Super size idiot. I'm gonna hit him. I'm gonna hit him with the remix tonight, man. So famous Jameis, the you big dummy remix is for you, brother. You big dummy. You big dummy. Why is it sucker? You big dummy. The remix. Big Dummy remix was famous Jameis Winston. Now, we got we got a special guy, man, sitting there in the chamber. You know, we I told you we was gonna talk NFL draft. That's major. You know, I mean that's the king of American sports. You can say what you want about baseball, hockey, and everything else. We love them all. But the king is the National Football League. And this guy uh, is one of our writers, AJ, 
and he's been doing some some scouting blogs for us. Matter of fact, he has a a, a hot blog in that we're going to get published tonight uh, about you know the draft, and we're excited to have him on. AJ, man, I see you over there chilling in the barbershop, brother. We're going to bring you in. Big AJ, man, what, what's going on, brother? Not much, guys. How you doing? Good, 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 man. Now, now don't 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 take any uh, offense to this, man. But we, we said we wanted you to come in and be our Ron Jaroski tonight, man. We want you to be Jaws tonight, man. Sounds good. I only got the high pitched voice, but I can try. <laughs> no, we really don't want you to be Jaws, man, because Jaws is all over the place. <laughs> but but anyways, man, it's, it's it's good to have you here, man. You know, the draft is is this year especially. It's looking like it's really going to be super unpredictable with, you know, where the number one pick is going to go. We've heard all kind of talk from Jadavian Clowney to, you know, Blake Bortles to, to Johnny Manziel and a few other names. Uh, so I know you've been paying attention to these things and, and the rumors and everything that's going back and forth. So when this thing kicks off on on Thursday, tomorrow, uh, let's just start out with the number one pick. How do, how do you feel Oh, where do you feel the number one pick is going to be uh, used? Uh, who's going to be picked for the number one draft? I mean, the number one uh, draft pick. Yeah, I mean, latest reports I've heard out of Houston are that it's down to Manziel and Clowney. So uh, if I'm Houston, I'm leaning more towards Clowney. I'm not sold on Manziel personally. Uh, Clowney's a once-in-a-lifetime prospect. I mean, this guy is a freak. 270 runs a 4-5. I mean, you don't find that every day and. You put him across J.J. Watt, and all of a sudden you've got a dangerous defense there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, those are some hell of five bookends. You know, obviously the, the the Texans need help everywhere, but like you said, this guy's, you just, you know, you, you can't pass up on this guy. I mean, it kind of reminds me, I don't know what you think about it, A.J., but it kind of reminds me back when, when uh, Mario Williams and Reggie Bush were going up yeah. against each other. You know, and that's yeah. where Houston went with defense. You know, exactly. I mean, you look at all the Super Bowl winning teams the last few years. Yeah, I mean, you got the Ravens, you got the Seahawks. They win with defense. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you need a quarterback, but uh, I, I'm not sold on Manziel personally. I don't think he'll fit their system. Uh, Bill O'Brien's always worked with a pocket quarterback, not more of a mobile quarterback. He developed Tom Brady uh, as quarterback at Penn State. Uh, Christian Hackenberg was also a pocket quarterback, so I think you could find one later on at a deep class. I can grab a guy like uh, Bridgewater now sliding to the second. If you can go get Clowney and Bridgewater, and that's a steal of the draft right there to me. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, let's talk about Bridgewater. You just mentioned them. Uh, there has been that talk that he's going to slide out of the first round. How how likely do you think that is? I think it's very likely. I mean, you got four teams in the top ten that really need a quarterback, and then Houston, Jacksonville, Cleveland. Uh, and personally, I say Minnesota, uh, but I, I I don't see Bridgewater after that pro day really fitting in any of those top ten needs, and after that, there's a real big drop off. Uh, I think it really depends on what Cleveland does it for. If they reach for Der- Derek Carr like they're supposed to, uh, I don't see them taking him at 26. So if if Cleveland goes QB at four, I don't think Bridgewater gets taken in the first round, uh, bearing any trade that somebody comes back in to get him. I think he could easily slide down to Houston at 32 or 33. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah, we got you know B Rye here and, and Big Danny here and Ted here as, as well. Uh, B Rye, let's 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 get in it with it with AJ a little bit, man. Uh, now you got your your Dolphins uh, uh, picking there in the first round. B Rye, first of all, where do you see your Dolphins going? And then AJ, I'd like to see you uh, weigh in on it a little bit. Uh, well, I mean, it all depends who's still on the board. Uh... Obviously, they're, they're eyeing tackle. Um, the one that could drop to him is Zach Martin out of Notre Dame. Uh, ideally, they would love uh, Tal Lewin out of Michigan, but I, I don't think he's going to fall anywhere near where the Dolphins are going to be. Um, so if they stay pat, um, I, I think that uh, – You'll look at him, see him go C.J. Mosley to come in and play inside linebacker and then take an Ellerby and move him outside uh, because their linebackers last year were atrocious. Uh, you know, Ellerby playing inside linebacker for the first year, but, uh, you know, Philip Wheeler, who a lot of, you know, everyone, myself included, thought was a good pick, was just absolutely terrible last year. Didn't get to the quarterback much. 
terrible in coverage, so they definitely need help at linebacker. Uh, you know, I, I think they can get a good starting right tackle in the second round. Um, ideally, I, I think what's going to happen, Cleveland is going to trade up, will trade down, and Cleveland is going to take, you know, depending on what quarterback uh, slides, because I, I see both Manziel and Teddy Bridgewater both sliding. Uh, Cleveland's going to trade up and draft. Uh, you know, whatever quarterback's number one on their board right there. Gotcha. What, what's your thoughts on that there, AJ? Uh, that's exactly who I had going to Miami at 19 is Mosley. Um, I don't think Martin will, will get there. I have two teams in the teams that I think will snag him should he pass the Steelers. Uh, I got the Cowboys taking Martin. Uh, if Donald's not on the board, which I think uh, Chicago's going to snag Donald with the 14th pick, uh, Zach Martin. I don't think you could pass on him if you're Dallas there. You, you need interior line help. He could play guard. He could play tackle. And even Baltimore, they lost Michael Lord to Tennessee, so they have a hole now at the right tackle spot. I don't see him getting past them if he does get past Dallas. And, and Miami does need linebacker help. Like I said, last year they did sign LRB, they signed Wheeler. Uh, that didn't work out too well. And uh, uh, New Regime's going to look for some linebackers here. And I think Mosley, if not Mosley, Ryan Shazer at Ohio State would be a good fit as well because he can play inside or outside. So uh, I do agree there that Mosley would be a solid pick. Um, maybe even the receiver. I, I've been hearing a few things that, that Miami's looking for the receiver because they're not really uh, – they're definitely trying to get rid of Wallace. They looked at her a few times this offseason to see if they could find a trade partner, but obviously nobody wants that contract. So maybe go receiver. If, uh, if a Lee slides or maybe a Cooks, maybe snag him and look again to, to move Wallace. It is not – I mean, you need somebody across from all. So Hartline's a good possession guy, but I personally think he's number two in the NFL, and you can never have too many receivers in this league. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, man. Now, you know, I want to kind of bring it back to, to the quarterback discussion. You know, we talked Johnny Manziel. We talked Teddy Bridgewater. These guys, you know, had a lot of glitz and glam around them in college and, you know, a lot of the expert opinions is whereas, yes, you know, they, they had excellent college careers. Uh, it may not transition well to, to the pros. Uh, but somebody who did not get a lot of glitz and glam is a local kid here in Orlando, out of Oviedo, be specific, UCF, former UCF quarterback Blake Bortles. Uh, his his pro day was excellent. You know, he, he made all the right passes. He has the right build. You know, huge build, uh, and he saw, had, seems to have a lot of upside. Where, where do you see him going this year? Yeah, I like Blake a lot. I mean, he, he's my second best QB on my board. I see him going to Minnesota. Uh, apparently, they're in love with him. They're even willing to trade up for him. Um, so I do see the Rams possibly trading down to eight, and the Vikings moving on up and grabbing Bortles with a two pick. If not, he, if he's not there at eight. Uh, which I think he will be, though. I mean, uh, the way my board goes, uh, the only quarterback I have going uh, in the top five is Derek Carr, and uh, I don't believe that as well myself as far as he's the best quarterback, but Cleveland's in love with him, and I don't think he'll be there at 26. I think there's a few quarterbacks in the top ten that uh, – well, I'm sorry, a few teams in the top ten that may snag someone. I like Bortles going eight to Minnesota. Uh, and I got Manziel going to Tampa Bay at seven. Uh, Lovey Smith apparently really likes Manziel. Oh wow! Yeah, so uh, I'm hey. thinking. I'm thinking if Bortles, if if Minnesota does not trade up, I see Bortles staying staying there at eight, uh, and they'll get him at eight. Now I hate to keep. Uh, thanks for all of that. Those expert uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, I hate to keep bringing this guy's name up, but it's just popping up all over the place, man. With this man, you know, Manziel here, Manziel there. The, la the latest rumor that I heard is the Cowboys. Are, are interested in keeping Johnny in Texas. What's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I heard the rumor as well, um, and I looked into it myself to see. I'm, I'm personally a Cowboys fan, so uh, I really wanted to check in on this, and then I uh, saw that someone had reported it. It wasn't anybody uh, in authority. It, it was honestly just someone mocked him there, and uh, it gained some uh, traction. But uh, apparently, as of yesterday, Jerry Jones reported it to ESPN, that the Cowboys have no interest in drafting Manziel. Um, now, I don't believe that personally. I think if he's there at 16, uh, they would consider it. Uh, but I honestly don't think he'll get past 10. There's no way he'll get he'll get out of the top 10. 
Um, but, I mean, you never know. It's Jerry Jones, so it's hard to predict him. I personally don't think he'll be there at 16. I don't think they'll trade up for him. They have way too many needs to do so. Um, mm. And I think too many teams in the top 10 need a quarterback, and they won't let him get past there. Got you, got you. Go ahead, B-Rat. I'm, I'm just thinking, I think it's going to be like last year. I, I think you're going to see these quarterbacks start to slide. Um, I think Bortles, he, he'll definitely, I think he'll be the first quarterback taken. Um, but I, I see the rest of them sliding. And, you know, maybe teams jockey in after that to try to trade back into the first round and get these guys that are sliding because of the quarterback need. But I just think that, you know, there's no home run out there and wasting a first, you know, could possibly waste a first-round pick because there's, there's a lot of talent at the top of this draft in other positions. And I see teams going elsewhere and getting their line or, you know, getting a receiver like Sammy Watkins or Mike Evans and then either trading back in or hoping one of those guys falls to him in the second round. I think you're going to see the quarterbacks free fall again this year. You know, we saw E.J. Manuel come out of really nowhere and get drafted in the first round last year. And he was the only QB. Uh, like I said, I think I see, I see Bortles, but I, I see Manziel and Bridgewater and Carr, all those guys sliding down to, you know, mid to late first round. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I do agree. If, 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 if the boy plays out the way I have it, I mean, uh, I don't see many QBs going. Um, I think if, if you get to Oakland uh, and you get past there and no QB is taken, you're going to see that slide because Tampa – I mean, they have Josh McCown. I hear they're in love with Manziel, but if they pass on him, I mean, you only got a few teams from that point that, that really would consider taking a QB in the first round. I got Minnesota at eight, who I think you're right, Bortles would be gone at that point. Um, but then after that, maybe Tennessee. Uh, after that, I mean, you're looking at a slide. And I think at that point, Cleveland at 26 would be the next option. And if you only have two QBs going in the first round, especially with a deep QB class, you could see a serious slide like Barkley had last year drop into the fourth round after the guy was considered the first round and slowly slid to the second. Maybe you see the same thing with Bridgewater this year. The guy just continues to slide. Yeah. Yeah, now 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 even though <laughs> we we not gonna compare you to Jaws. We're we're gonna <laughs> talk about Jaws for a second, AJ. Um this guy is I mean he is all kicked. You know what I really want to say? Yeah. Zach Mettenberger, a guy that, that has questionable knees. I mean, he's definitely tall, and, I mean, he, he you know, he has the mechanics, but don't know if he really has the, you know, the physical wherewithal, you know, going into the league with bad knees to be a successful guy. What's your thoughts on Zach Mettenberger? I, I I like him. I mean, I don't like him nearly as much as Jaws does. I mean, I, I think unfortunately the NFL now is infatuated with an arm strength that that really doesn't translate to the NFL. And you look at the top quarterbacks in the league, none of them have that top arm. I mean, Brady is a good arm. He's not elite. Manning, he does not have a strong arm, but he's accurate. I mean, these big arms that all these teams like, they don't pan out. I mean, Jamarcus Russell throw the ball 80 yards, couldn't hit a guy five feet away. I mean. He, you got Ryan Mallett. I could throw the ball 60 miles an hour, but it's not about how hard you can throw it. I think that's the that's the thing with Mettenberg. He's looking at his size, he's 6'5", he's a big dude. Uh, he's got a great arm, played in an NFL-style system. Uh, but, again, I do have questions myself. Like you said, the knees, he does have an injury. Coming off ACL, it's never a good injury to have. Uh, and, and, personally, I I think he's inaccurate. He's good on the under, uh, underneath throws, but deep balls, he is not accurate. Um, I, personally, if you want to know my opinion, my favorite quarterback in this draft is, is no one that anybody talks about. It's Jimmy Garoppolo out of Eastern Illinois. That is my number one quarterback on my board. Now, now you do know that, uh, I mean, this is the barbershop, so we got to keep it real. Uh, there's another quarterback that you're familiar with out of Eastern Illinois, being a Cowboys fan. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's, you know, Tony Romo, as a matter of fact, who showed up at the Dallas Mavericks game the other oh, yeah. night. And of course, the Dallas Mavericks lost. <laughs> Jeff he shows up. Everybody shows up as well. He went to the Duke game; they lost in the first round. He went right. to the Mavericks game; they lost. He went to the uh, Stars game; they lost. He just has that thing about him. Oh God, man! I mean, but he—you he, know—he's a stats machine, man. 
and and you know Illinois is uh, one of those states. Not it's kind of kind of like Pennsylvania, where you know they, they produce uh, successful quarterbacks for for some reason. Uh, he's not getting the glitz and glam of some of the other names that we talked about. But you really feel like he can come in and be uh, successful day one in this league. I think I need a year to develop. Uh, the reason I say so is because of the competition he played against. Uh, but this guy has it all, man. He's got a he's got a very good arm. He's mobile. He's very accurate. He's very poised. He does not fold under pressure. He's got what you look for in a quarterback. Every interview he aced it. Uh, this guy reminds me of Aaron Rodgers. Uh, it's crazy to say it's a big comparison, but he does. Aaron Rodgers wow. sat for a few years by Brett Favre, came in and destroyed it. And I think that's exactly what Garoppolo is going to do. I think a team like Jacksonville in the second round would be perfect. Sit him a year behind Henny, let him learn the system, has a good defense developed in there with Gus Bradley. This kid can come in and be good, and I think he will eventually be the best quarterback out of this class. Wow. Wow. So all you all you uh, NFL draft, you know, wannabe scouts and experts out there, man, AJ's dropping these jewels, man, and, and I'm, I'm loving it because tomorrow, uh, uh, Friday, and Saturday, bro, I'm going to be keyed in, number one, my, you know, my, you're a Cowboys fan. My New Orleans Saints, man, my hometown, New Orleans, they got to pick in every round. Yep. So I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. I know Rob Ryan is excited because, I, you know, obviously the goal there is to, to take that defense, even though they, you know, uh, performed very well last year, to take it to the next level. You know, I mean, they already brought in um, uh, uh, Bird, Jarvis Bird from, from, from Buffalo, uh, to tag, tag team with uh, Kenny Vaccaro, who they just drafted out of Texas last year. Uh, they're going to be needing some cornerback help and things of that nature. And and, and while I have the, you, the expert in the house, man, what do you think the Saints should do with their first-round pick? I have a few different ways. I mean, um, I definitely need – I definitely think they would need a pass rusher uh, off the edge. I think I like I like D forward out of Auburn. I mean, they get the – Natural pass rusher. I mean, you see what Rob Ryan does to all his pass rusher. I mean, he makes DeMarcus Ware a beast. Not that he wasn't good before, but, I mean, he utilized him the right way in a 3-4 system, and I think that's exactly what the Saints need. I also think receiver. I mean, Meacham, uh, I think he came back on a one-year deal, but Colston was not himself last year. Lance Moore is gone. Uh, yeah, you got Kenny Stills, but I think a receiver, if one slides, like a, maybe even Corey Lattimore at Indiana, like, he's, he's good. They need another receiver to start start developing there, and I think he can come in and play right away, and anyone in the world can put up a 1,000 yards in that system, so I think receiver, outside linebacker, and cornerback, you got Champ on a one-year deal, so you might be able to hold off one more year, uh, but, but I do see going defense most likely, if not defense receiver, because Rob Bryan does uh, need a few more pieces. Yes, that that he does, that he does. Now, thanks for that, man, because you, you got me feeling exactly the way way I was thinking what they need to do, so I appreciate that. Now, the other panelists that are sitting here uh, chilling in the cut, you got an Atlanta Falcons fan uh, in, in, in Big Danny. They got the number six pick. Uh, you know, They're trying to bounce back from, from a horrible year last year. I don't think you know, they'll be at six when the draft comes through, I'll tell you that. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I see, I see them getting up to the one spot. I mean, there's a lot of talk. They, they're not afraid to trade up like with Julio Jones. Uh, and there's a lot of talk that Houston's trying to move that one pick and Atlanta's really pushing for Clowney. I mean, um, the compensation is still being worked out. But what I've heard, they're going to have to give up this year's one and next year's one to move up to the first pick. Uh, and honestly, if I'm Atlanta, I do it. I mean, you need a few holes, but a guy like Clowney come in, boost that defense. I think last year so many injuries caused that team to just deflate. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a rough start. Julio will be back full strength this year. Uh, that offense is going to score points. So, you go get Clowney, uh, a defense you put, you know, O.C. on one side, Clowney on the other. You signed a few deep tackles in the offseason. I think this defense can be really, really good, and uh, I think they can bounce back in a very strong way. There you go. I, I know Big Danny is appreciative of that breakdown. And he's sitting here. <laughs> we, call him, we call him Teddy Two Teams, AJ, because I don't know if he's a fan of the New York Jets or the Seattle Seahawks. But, I, I uh, do have a question. Go ahead. I do go have ahead. a question. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about my, um, you know, Super Bowl champion Seahawks right now. Because, you know, <laughs> oh, God. we're going to push that to the side. <laughs> so I have a 
you know, uh, a, a, a soft spot in my heart, AJ, for the New York Jets. And I don't know if it's because, because I'm, I'm stuck here, marooned. I can't leave this place for some reason. But that, that's a, another story for another time. So the question I have for you is, I've been in contact with um, Terry Bradway, the, the, the Jets director of college scouting, and John Idzik. Of course, this is all in my dreams. So, And they need a draft consultant. So I was thinking about you because the situation with the Jets right now, we know last year with D. Milner and, and Sheldon Richardson. So I would say two diamonds in a rough. Um, this year alone, the Jets have, have, have – gone and visited over 250 schools, and including re- repeat trips, that's like 550 school, vi- school trips total. So my question to you is, they had 12 picks, including you know, compensatory uh, picks, and they are drafting at, for the first round, number 18, and you know they have holes at wide receiver, cornerback, you name it. Yeah. Um, what would you tell Terry Bradway or John Idzik when you're in the draft, you know, in the war room tomorrow? I'm telling you, you got a deep receiver class. Uh, I wouldn't reach for one. I think you got to go grab. Uh, in my board right here, the way I had planned it out is our cousin Denard, Denard is going to be there. If he's there, I think you snag him. He's a perfect man coverage guy. Uh, this is exactly what the Jets need. They need a man corner. They lost from Florida to Arizona. Uh, you got nobody playing across Miller right now. I mean, you got Kyle Wilson, the guy's been a decent nickel at best. Uh, I think you got to grab Denard, or, and even if not, I'd go Roby. Uh, Bradley Roby at Ohio State, both man corners that can press. Uh, they can play perfect coverage with exactly what Rex Ryan would need. Uh, I, I, if I'm the Jets, I go corner there. And then in the second round, like I said, you got a deep receiver class. I actually see Calvin Benjamin sliding. Uh, you got a Calvin Benjamin there. you got an Alan Robinson at a Penn State. Even a Jordan Matthews at a Vanderbilt. These are three guys that can come in and play right across to Eric Decker, and I don't think Decker's a one, but I think you got two good guys there, and then Curly out of the slot, and you can build a good offense while, while getting your corners taken care of because Rex Ryan's always needed corners. He's always had a great corner duo wherever he's been, and he's been successful with that. I think if you go into the year with Miller and Kyle Wilson, it's going to be rough, I mean, especially if they don't have the great pass rushing up front. I mean, your linebackers are decent. Calvin Pace had a fluke 10 sack season. I don't think he'll repeat that. Quan Cobos hasn't been what they've wanted. I think you've got to go corner here to give your front seven more time to get to the QB and take the in passing game. Because you're playing against Tom Brady. I mean, the only way he'll beat him is if you take his game away. I mean, the only way you're going to stop Tom Brady is by locking down his receivers. Got it. Thanks no a doubt. lot. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. And I just want to make a slight, slight correction there about the, the NFL draft. It's actually uh, next week. But yeah, we're just hyped, and we're excited. So <laughs> we're talking about it now, and we'll be talking about it next week as, <laughs> as well. Uh, AJ, uh, tell the fans what they can expect uh, out of this blog that's going to be come, going up on Barbershop Sports later on this evening. Yeah, I put together my top 20 at each position. Uh, my final uh, prospect rankings uh, took me a little while to really develop all the quarterbacks and look at all the tapes and, and really break down a, a bunch of players here. And after doing a bunch of reviewing and Really, how I had to go up and slide up my board since my previous one. I mean, it's hard to find tape from Eastern Illinois, uh, but after I did, uh, I really like this kid. Like I said, I think he, he can really develop into a franchise quarterback, and I don't see any franchise quarterbacks in this draft outside of Garoppolo. That's uh, a bold statement, but I don't think Manziel will be that good. I think he'll be decent at best, if even a starter after four years. And Bortles, to me, has the potential. Uh, it really depends on my position of where he gets drafted. I think he needs a defense. I don't think he's going to be uh, your Big Ben, uh, like he's being compared to. Uh, Big Ben just has things that, that other people don't. Now, I don't see Bulls coming in and winning Super Bowls and, and being a great QB, so check it out. I mean, I got my prospect rankings up there for every position, top 20 at each position. Uh, definitely check it out and uh, let me know what you think. No doubt, no doubt. And, uh, you know, like I said, that, that'll be – be up up to tonight. Uh, we appreciate the the excellent expert breakdown. And uh, actually, uh, if you have the time, we'd love for you to come back next week as well to uh, talk about it as the draft unfolds. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 by by the way, 
you know, we didn't get a chance to, I didn't, I know I didn't get a chance to, to uh, congratulate you personally, but, you know, on being becoming a new father, brother, congratulations, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's uh, definitely been great. It's a, it's a great feeling. It's, uh, I can't really explain it, but it's, uh, it's definitely a blessing. That's good, man. That's good. Well, I I, I know uh, Danny is also has a, a, a young child and uh, experience in fatherhood as well, so I know he can relate to that and uh, some of our other guys as well, man. So congratulations, brother. We're going to get that blog up, and let's get you in the barbershop again next week to break some more stuff down, brother. Sounds good. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely, man. Have a good one. You too. Thank you. Right. Thanks, AJ. That right, guys. No doubt. You know. You know what? Next week, when we get AJ in the house, uh, B. Right. I know you want to be itching to ask him about those baseball trades. I thought about that. But I said, man, this, this you know football talk is so juicy. I said, let's let's go ahead and squeeze that. <laughs> so That's we got to get him. That's okay. <laughs> It's a whole nother segment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you got you got a whole ton of questions. <laughs> oh man, good stuff, good stuff. Well, uh, once again, thank AJ for coming through. Hockey right now is just freaking amazing with with all of the game sevens, the competition. You know, yes. I, I do have my Tampa Bay Lightning fitted hat on right now, and yes, they're not there, but we will be back next year. Next year, Ben Bishop getting them healthy. But what's happening right now? Game seven, the New York Rangers came out on top. You know, we kind of worried about them in Philly, but you know what, B. Ryan, that is why you have Game Seven in your house, brother. That is why, and they and they pulled it off. Yeah. And they pulled it off 2-1 and moving on uh, to to the next round. So, first of all, you know, it's not over yet. But congratulations to the New York Rangers on pulling it out. They got that one. Um, you know, they're B-Rod, you're saying it like, yeah, they got they still got some uh, a force to run into. You're like, yeah, they got that one. But <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm not even talking about the Bruins. They're going to have a battle. uh you know, the next round going against uh, Pittsburgh and being able to try to hold them boys down. And, uh, you know, Longquist isn't playing good at goal, but he's going to have to play great in goal. Uh, you know, I saw the toughness when they traded Call- Callahan, and they're still, you know, um, Pitt, uh, Pittsburgh is a, a finesse team. Uh, the Rangers can overpower them, but at the same time, Pittsburgh has you know, some of the, the best in, in all of hockey. And, you know, like I said, Lundquist played good this last series. Um, you know, I, I thought they would win in five or six. Uh, surprisingly, nobody went to seven. But, to, you know, to move on and get to the Eastern Conference Finals, Lundquist is going to have to play great in goal. No doubt. There's, there's, there's absolutely no doubt about it as you get closer and closer to the cup. You, you know, you got to take your game to the next level. And, you know, as we saw, you know, here down here in Tampa, <laughs> when your goalie goes down, you go down, you know. So he's definitely, like you say, he's he's, he's a, a world-class goalie, but he's going to have to take his, his level to, you know, Hall of Fame, per, you know, uh, 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 levels. Because you know Pittsburgh is 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 a, is a uh, offensive team, man. You got to sit the kid there in, in company. So it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be fun. Um, be right, your Bruins, and you know I still support them as well. Got the four one <laughs> win over Detroit. <laughs> I kind of like Teddy two teams in hockey, man. You know Lightning and Bruins. Uh, yeah. But yeah, exactly, exactly. And since my Lightning aren't in it, I, I may I may be switching to a Boston Bruins fitted, but you know that remains to be seen. Don't be trying to put the <laughs> on Boston now. You, you stay down there with Tampa. You can root for the Rangers or Pittsburgh, but don't be bringing your curse up here. <laughs> I, I know, right? Because the, the Bruins team, now. The, the last <laughs> team I put the hat on for got swept, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I want none of that. No doubt. So how you? 
him faring up against the uh, the Canadians? You know, the Canadians are, um, I think, a team that's underestimated. Uh, you know, Price played really well in the last series to get by Tampa Bay. Um, but I, I just think, you know, the, the Bruins will ultimately win this because of their physicality. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is why, what gives the Bruins, why they've been there the last few years, you know, uh, beating Vancouver, losing last year to Chicago in the finals. Um, they're a big, strong, physical team. Uh, they got a great team and Tuka Rask back there. Um, and I think ultimately they're, they're just too much and they overwhelm the Canadians. Um, you know, I think it'll probably go, uh, see, I don't want to sound cocky because it's my team, but, you know, <laughs> I think the Canadians will, uh, they'll, they'll sneak one out. Um, you know, five games, uh, I'm going to say this one goes again. Uh, okay. like the last series that, uh, Boston was in with Detroit, so. Um, I think ultimately uh, there's too much boxing, too much physicality. And, too big, uh, too strong. Yep. And then, you know, yeah. they move on. And, you know, hopefully it's, <laughs> I, you know, I, I would take either, uh, you know, Pitt or the Rangers right now. Pittsburgh or the Rangers right now. And I, I, I think Boston has a, a very good shot of making – Finals uh, again this year. It's going to be about that matchup and who comes out of the West because you know the West is deep and they're talented. Um, yes. But I think you know you ask most hockey people that you know even going in that Boston was the favorite to go to represent the East again this year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it can't. It doesn't. Ted and, 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 and Dan and B-Rye and everybody out there in the Barbershop Sports Nation, it doesn't get any better in sports than what you're seeing right now competition-wise from, from the NHL and, you know, the NBA, which we'll get into a little bit later. But the NHL, man, it's just wow. This, this first round has, has been a, a, a amazing and it's looking like it's going to, you know, continue all the way to the cup. So, you, you know, we talked about how talented the West is, b Right. You got San Jose in L.A., you know, shout out to, to my homie Jonathan Quick, Kings all day out there, West Coast. Uh, the Sharks versus the Kings, the series is tied up. It's very, we, we, we're speaking about competition and the parity. These guys are going at it. How do you see that series ending up? <laughs> um. Have you cut out there at the end? What what was the question? Oh, I'm sorry about that. I was asking about the 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 sharks and 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 kings. They're tied up right now. Oh. How do you see that series ending up? Man, you know you <laughs> you think that you know San Jose jumping up three nothing on them, but and now LA coming back and tying the series. You know, right now I I gotta give I gotta give it to LA. With the momentum on their side, um, battling back and bringing it to a game seven, um, you know, I've, San Jose is and has been for the last few years a team that does great in the regular season and kind of fizzles out once it comes uh, playoff time. So, um, you know, like I said, all the momentum right now is in <laughs> the King's corner because, I mean, being down and coming back, I mean, that just gives you so much, uh, you know, energy. Uh, you know, every game's do or die. This one's no different. And I think it kind of deflates um, San Jose. I mean, they got a lot of veterans on that team. Uh, you know, Patrick Marley and uh, uh, Pavelski and stuff like that. And... Uh, you know, they got a lot of talent and a lot of veteran guys, but I think right now, coming, you know, allowing a team to come back and forcing the game seven, it kind of, you know, it deflates them, I think, you know, not be able to put, them, put uh, this series away and move on. So I, I'm going to go with L.A. I think L.A. and, and no, win this series. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, you know, that's that's uh, one of the well-known franchises 
in this league, you know what I'm saying, thanks to the one and only great one himself, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, but I, I still shout out my main man, Jonathan Quick. I, I hope they, they can pull it off. Uh, but there's another series in this on this conference on the, on the West Coast that's also tied, B. Right? I mean, this man. What 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 more do you want from sports, brother? The Colorado Avalanche and the Minnesota Wild, both you know, <laughs> knotted up at three. Yep. I mean, you were glued to the a, TV while this is on, brother. This has been a wild series, and this is you know one that surprised me. You know, I thought. <laughs> Sick and tired of hearing all these noises in my head. I can't seem to make them go away. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, you know, that's that's uh, one of the well-known franchises in this league, you know what I'm saying, thanks to the one and only great one himself, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, but I, I still shout out my main man, Jonathan Quick. I, I hope they, they can pull it off. Uh, but there's another series in this on this conference on the, on the West Coast that's also tied, B. Right? I mean, this man. What 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 more do you want from sports, brother? The Colorado Avalanche and the Minnesota Wild, both you know, <laughs> knotted up at three. Yep. I mean, you were glued to the a, TV while this is on, brother. This has been a wild series, and this is you know one that surprised me. You know, I thought Minnesota would win, uh, you know, a game or two, but to you know push Colorado. Uh, a very good team to the distance in Game Seven. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that 
Uh, you know, as it, as it is right now, um, Colorado is up one nothing in the first period. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I in our barbershop bracket, I, I did have Colorado moving on. So um, <laughs> this, this, like you said, uh, it's been a great series, and it's been a surprise series. I mean, um, I thought that. You know, the, the one that would go seven and be the best series of the first round uh, didn't, and that was St. Louis and Chicago. Um, right. I thought St. Louis was going to win that series, and, you know, they had a tough draw in Chicago. I thought they were going to win it, but, uh, you know, the defending champ didn't want to go so quietly into the night and uh, bounced down St. Louis in the first round, who's playing great hockey coming into this point, but um, that didn't matter. So this series has been, uh, you know, a pleasant surprise for – uh, you know, hockey fans of all. You know, you don't just got to be an Avalanche fan, but I think everyone in general. Uh, once you see a game seven, especially hockey, it's some of the best in all the sports uh, to sit down and watch that game. Yeah, I mean, it's fast. It's fast paced. You know, you you got the hitting and occasional scrums. You know, it, it takes a little uh, adjustment to try to keep up with the puck, but there's so much action going on, you know, <laughs> eventually it just all, you know, comes together. So, and I'm, and I'm testifying as a guy who didn't watch much hockey, and I'm still learning, but it is very, very engaging. And I'm, I'm telling everybody out there, if you haven't had a chance to, to watch hockey at all, this is the time, you know, during the playoffs, because you're going to see some of the best hockey. Now, you know, the, the, the flagship show that I was on last night when we talked about hockey uh, B. Rye, I I don't know if one of the guys was from Canada. Or he's just you know partial to Canada, but he said that it was disappointing that the only Canadian team in the playoffs was Montreal. You know, and I told him I said, hey man, I said y'all got the damn gold medal, man. What else y'all want from us, man? Hey, you know? they they let him breathe that up there. They wanted to see them all in there. I mean, yeah, I know. <laughs> they won all Canadian final. <laughs> Yeah, I know they do. It's the gold medal or not, but, you know, they want more hockey up there. Um, but like you said, probably most people, um, and I don't know, though, you know, they're, they're loyal up there, so I, I don't know if there's going to be a lot of Canadians just, you know, automatically jumping on that Montreal bandwagon. But, uh, you know, regardless of who they're rooting for, I think, you know, it has been a great start to – the playoffs this year. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. All these matchups have been awesome. They uh, <laughs> exciting games. Uh, you know, it makes it better when your team wins, like the Bruins. And you know, I know uh, Espo is uh, a Rangers fan, so he was happy tonight. Um, but even if you, you know, you're not a fan of any of these teams, just to watch this hockey, I think it has been a, a, just an awesome first round. Uh, you know, we talked. We touched on the game seven, even those series that, you know, um, didn't go game seven, like that St. Louis Chicago series. That was a great series. You know, uh, St. Louis being down one goal, uh, tying it up with 45 seconds, winning it in overtime. You know, it's just uh, exciting playoff hockey. And you know, um, F. Bama just updated us that the Wild just tied it up. So now it's one one in game seven, and. <laughs> It's still in the first period, so, you know, uh, it's close to TV, you know, put it on mute, listen to us, and watch the game. Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, I mean, go, you know, go get you a beer. I mean, if you don't drink beer, get what you drink, you know what I'm saying, and just, just chill out and, and and take it in. I mean, and you can break back and forth because a lot of times right now, you know, the NBA games and hockey games will overlap a little bit. So, you know, when the, when the basketball game breaks, you can split, switch, switch over and see, you know, a little more competition sometimes. I mean, especially if your series was a Bobcats heat, you ain't seeing no competition there. So, sorry, Danny, but, you know, if you had to choose between Bobcats and heat, you, you might as well go watch some hockey, you know. So, uh, shout out to them. I see the Minnesota Wild. Thanks, F-Bomb, in, in the chat room, have, have tied it up. So, they, they are fighting to see who gets to the Blackhawks. I love it. Hockey playoffs are in full swing. So hope everybody out there is enjoying it. Now, 
we, we, before we get to, uh, you know, we're going to get Espo in here uh, a little later in a minute. Uh, and before we talk John Jones, you know, I just want to take a little brief second, uh, not even a second, just a, a moment for, for pop culture, man. And, and, and Big Ted, I, I mean, I see you over there, brother, uh, doing your thing. But if you would, I, I need you to help me out with this, man. Just like Danny and b Right helped me out with Famous Jameis because um, I want to talk about Columbus Short, man. You know, uh, he was a part of, of a network television show that was, you know, my key word is was, that is one of the hottest shows in TV. Uh, it, it showing no signs of slowing down. He was playing a major character on the show, Ted, but his life was also, like the show, a scandal. Ted, this man, in the, within a short span of a couple of months, has busted somebody up in the bar. Yeah. I mean, beat him down. Has held a knife to his wife's throat. <laughs> Yeah, he's, his wife. He's lost it. He's lost it. Hell, you know, threatened to kill her, threatened to kill himself, and it's just been an on. And this is this is you know, when we kind of get into Donald Sterling, like you know, yeah, this was the eruption, but there was signs that this volcano has been bubbling for a while, and it's the same thing with Columbus Short. You know, you know he he has a history. You know, a couple of years ago, he beat somebody up really bad on the basketball court over an argument. Brother, can we get him in some anger management classes, Big Ted? God damn. Something. something. And, and if you're checking TMZ, TMZ over the Easter weekend, he broke into his, um, I don't know, his, his wife or his estranged wife's house and ransacked the joint. <laughs> This is just this past weekend. Oh my God! You, you, you know, you know they uh, they he was he was being interviewed on the Tom Joyner radio show about his character and and the season finale and everything. And they asked him, and, and he I mean, first of all he was disinterested in this interview. So I, I don't even know why you go on an interview if you don't plan on answering questions because that's kind of the point, you know. Uh, so he goes on Tom Jonah, he's really kind of like, you know, aloof with his questions, one-word answers, you know, cutting them off. And so they kind of asked him a little bit about how the season finale took place, what happened with his character, you know. And, I, you know, f for those folks who didn't see it, you know, I'm one of the folks that didn't see it. I know a little bit about it, so I won't spoil it for you. But um, when they asked him about that, this dude dropped the N-word. On a radio show, like he, first of all, he like he was aggravated about his, them asking him about a character that he's playing. This is why your ass is on the damn show in the first place. This is why the people want to talk to you. This is why the people want to hear from you, and you're just acting ignorant and assholeish. You know, I mean, do, do these guys think that opportunities like this grow on trees, Big Ted? Obviously. Obviously, but this opportunity is just uh, the door just closed. The horse has just <laughs> left the barn. <laughs> Yo, hey, on, on, on that note, brother, you know, we, we talk about uh, when we were talking about Famous James earlier, how he has examples to kind of, you know, you got you got Darren Sharper, you know, you got Colin Kaepernick kind of dealing with some some mess. Uh, this guy, he he had uh, Columbus Short, he had Isaiah Washington. Now, right, you know, the writer of this show, uh, uh, Shonda Rhimes, is also the writer of Grey's Anatomy. And, you know, she's making a killing. Her shows are winning awards out of the wazoo. And this lady is not going to let anything affect the money train, brother. And it don't have anything to do with her being African-American and them being African-American. And look, it's business, you know. And, dude, Isaiah Washington, you know, Slipped up and, and, and used gay derogatory, uh, homosexual derogatory terms. Didn't back right. down from it. And guess what? Right. Even though he was a major character on Grey's Anatomy, 
fast done. off of my set. You're done. You're done. Done. Same thing. Columbus Short, you know, you're done. It's ridiculous. And and even though famous Jameis was, you know, a, a surprise, you big dummy. This is the first time that on this show we have played two you big dummy remixes back back because we got some major dummies out there. So for you, Columbus Short, you also get the remix to you, big dummy. You big dummy. You big dummy. Watch it, sucker. You big dummy. Hey, you know what else, Big Ted? You know what? Before we talk okay. Don Jones, before we talk Don Jones, this is how it went, man. You know, it, the the news broke that that you know he had got into this altercation with his wife. This was, you know, and then, then this other news you just mentioned that happened last weekend. You know. He's delusional. Men, people like this are, are completely delusional, Ted. They can do all of these things, and they think they'll still be okay, right? So he walks in Shonda Rhimes' office and talk about season three. Oh, I think, yeah, season three they're going into. Mm-hmm. And this is pretty much how the conversation went, right? He's like, what is Harrison going to do in season three? I kind of want to start preparing for my character, you know, you know, uh, getting in my zone before the season starts. And this is what Shonda said to him, man. Black and white, clear as crystal. You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. That's it, Ted. You lose. Hey, I, I just want to add this piece, and this is for whomever's listening. The yeah. fact that when you are on these type of shows, these ensemble type cast shows, you are not bigger than the brand. Yep. It's not you and the show. It's the show that comes first, and if there's anything that's going to derail the success of the show, you know, that piece or that person or that subject is removed. So there you go. That's, that's your celebrity news for this week. There you go. There you go. Now we're going to shift to, you know, B, Big B-Rise article on UFC 172. You know, I was one of the first people that got a chance. Matter of fact, I was, yeah, I think I was the first person that got a chance to read that article. And, you know, anytime John Bone Jones gets into the ring, it's, a, you know, it's an exciting time. I mean, the brother's, you know, just ridiculously talented. He's a, he's a freak, 84-inch reach, you know, elbows that are vicious, knees that are vicious, submission holes. I mean, his his repertoire, you know, he can do it all. Uh, he had a, a, a real tough matchup, matchup last uh, fight against uh, Alexander Gustafsson. You know, that guy was also tall and kind of negated a little bit of the, the advantages that he has, has excuse me, over, over shorter fighters. But b right, this went pretty much like you said it was going to go, man. Uh, towards the, <laughs> the end of that fight, man, I, I didn't know if it was John Jones bleeding or, or Glover Taxi ever bleeding, but it come to find out, man, he was covered in Glover's blood, man. Yeah. He uh <laughs> he caught him uh <laughs> with an elbow in the third round that opened up a, a nasty gash. Um <laughs> uh I it was bad. I mean it was well above his right eye and you know, it flat and you know John Bones Jones proved again that He's, you know, the best champion out there right now that the UFC has. Um, you know, he's going to be, he tied the record for uh, title defenses in the light heavyweight division. Uh, you know, Glover, sure, you know, I talked about him, had lost in 20 fights. He's not as polished as some other fighters, but he's, uh, you know, a big guy. Um, you know, so that was the one thing that Bones Jones wasn't able to do was knock him out, but he dominated the fight. He took all five rounds. Uh, he proved to be way too much for the share. Um, and, you know, one thing uh, Jones didn't do was utilize his wrestling. You know, he took uh, Glover down once. 
he was able to get up. Uh, didn't do really anything down there. Uh, but other than that, he stayed on top of him, and he used his length thing, really just uh, picked apart Lover, and like you said, you know, had that nasty cut, and, you know, Jones just took it to him. He, he rocked Lover a few times, um, but he wasn't able to, uh, you know, finish him out with a KO or TKO, but he definitely won that fight without a doubt, all five rounds, start to finish, you know, took it to him all over that octagon and, and proved, uh, you know, he still deserves to be the champion. So uh, this is lining up a, a rematch against uh, Gustafsson um, coming up, uh, you know, once uh, Bones, uh, you know, gets cleared, uh, gets some time off. Uh, you know, there's a talk that this fight could be fought over in uh, Sweden. And, you know, Bone Jones is the type of guy, he, he doesn't care what the fight's going to be. Um, I, I don't know if last time he took his office in a little uh, too lightly, maybe going into the fight just because, you know, he's from Sweden. Um, Denver had, you know, he, he made somewhat of a name for himself, but uh, it uh, wasn't too well known, especially, uh, you know, around the fight world, so... Uh, definitely made a name for himself after that Bones Jones fight, but you know that's what I touched again on my article about the heart of a champion that John has, and he, uh, I think he took him a little too lightly, and he got brought back down to planet Earth after those first two rounds that he didn't win, and came back among the last three. So, so I, I suspect this fight's going to be another war. Um, but again, I think in the end you, you're going to see Bones Jones. I think he's going to be even more determined and uh, more focused going into this fight, um, looking to prove that you know the last fight he wasn't on top of his game and he still won. And this one, he's going to bring his A game and you know win this fight. No doubt, no no doubt, man. Um, that's you know that's that's pretty much the way it's, it's, it's gone and it's going to go. I'm looking forward to that to that re, uh, rematch between those two to really see how it's going to uh, end up once and for all. If he's going to, you know, like you said, man, undisputed, leave no, you know, uh, uh, doubts that he is the champ. And if you really, really want that belt, I mean, you're going to have, you're going to have to bring your a game. Uh, and I don't really, I really don't think until, you know, you, you find a taller, talented fighter, that uh, you you really see him challenge unless you know he gets you know injured or something like that to stop him uh, from from keeping his rise to to greatness. Now, before we get out of, off of UFC, speaking of greatness, man, I'm looking at a picture of the one and the only Dana White with a a, a, a smile like a kid in Toys R Us that they told him, man, you can pick up anything you want off of these shelves and it's yours. And the reason why he's smiling like that, B-Rye, is because he's standing next to Ronda Rousey. And she is looking like, you know, whatever people worship, you know, whatever they call God, man. Like, he came down, man, and he said, you know what, I'm going to make a woman right quick, man. And and then he said, you're welcome. He dropped the mic, and it was Ronda Rousey. You know what I'm saying? He walked out. That's how, you know, it's a good-looking woman, man. I had to sell it for for the people out there, brother. But she made some comments about uh, Chris Cyborg, called Chris Cyborg an it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that, you know, I don't mean, it's just funny because of Ronda Rousey and her swagger. But, you know, uh, Glad was glad was not hot about that. When I say Glad, you know, the, the organization there uh, that, that fights for, for, for gay rights. Yeah, and, and what Dana White broke down was, you know, uh, that she would not be disciplined for those comments. And, and I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that before we moved on to Kentucky Derby. I mean, I, I don't think she didn't mean it in, in that sort of way. It wasn't a shot against, um, you know, the uh, transsexual community or if that's how they're taking it or anything against the uh, um, gay community, anything like that. It's the same. She's taking so much steroids that, <laughs> you know, she took away all her estrogen and filled it with testosterone. 
I didn't mean anything malicious to anyone else about those comments except for targeting at Chris Cyborg. And, you know, she is a lady that is not afraid to speak her mind. Um, she will tell her how it is. Uh, if you watch any interview with her, she, heck, um, you know, you, you got a question for you and she's going to answer it. So, and that's exactly what she did when, you know, asked about Chris Cyborg. I mean, she was a female fighter, I guess, suspended for the use of steroids. And she made no qualms about it. So, um, she thought, um, you know, I, I, there was more going into it about how she disgraced. You know, this is something that she's afraid of right now, and she's trying to bring even more attention to, is the woman fighting. So, you know, she sees this as, you know, a direct slap in the face of her, so she's going to stand up for what she believes in. And like I said, it was just an attack on Cyborg. It wasn't against anybody else, so... There's going to be people that take offense to most comments and anything malicious by it. Right. Oh, uh, you know, like I said, you know, I, <laughs> we got we had to talk about Ronda Rousey, man, just because. Any real chance quick, I guess I get to talk about Ronda, Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey. About, what's up, brother? Oh, I got another thing about Ronda Rousey. I brought it up in one of our prep meetings. I'm, I'll am say it out in the air. Because, I, I, you know, Joe Rogan uh, does the announcing for that, and he said that he thinks that Ronda would be for Money Mayweather in an in a MMA fight, match, an MMA fight. And I agree with that statement. And I, I will give the odds that Ronda would be Floyd at 10%. I'll give Floyd a 25% chance that he can knock her out. And that's it. Oh, ho, ho, ho. we had to get it in. Hey, brother, I ain't, I ain't mad at you, man, you know. I don't know about that one, but hey, I respect your opinion, man. I I I respect it. Um, let's uh let's talk with Espo though, because uh, he he's got a hot blog on Barbershop Sports about the Kentucky Derby. He's been talking about uh, the races leading up to the Kentucky Derby, and we're gonna get him in, Big Espo. Uh, thanks for coming into the Barbershop, folks. First of all, let's talk post draw. And uh, break it down, man, for people that are unfamiliar w with how these races work, uh, what horses to look out for, and what makes the Kentucky Derby so so exciting, brother. All right. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, basically, the way that this one runs differently than other other races is they actually televise the, um, the, the draw, and they basically put it on TV. They put 20 applications into a box. They pull an application, and they pull a pill, basically, out of a pill bottle. Whatever number from 1 to 20 comes out, whatever horse is drawn, that's where they go into the starting gate. Now, normal races, maximum 14 horses in a race, and it's tight. You really have a tight track with 14. Kentucky Derby has 20. So they use two gates. One's the first main gate, and then a second the auxiliary gate carries horses 15 through 20. Problem with that is, obviously, with 20 horses on that little track, can you imagine, you know, it's not meant for 20 horses. They're all banging into each other trying to get into position because nobody wants to be 20 horses wide on the first turn. So that's what makes this a different race than any other race. Even the next two races in the Triple Crown, we'll never see 20 horses. The Kentucky Derby is the only one that will ever see the 20 horses in the field and that's because it's the premier, uh, the premier jewel of the Triple Crown. It's the, you know, it's the one everybody knows about. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's fancy hats and a lot of celebrities show up to this event. Um, you got a Google Hangout about this, correct, yes. brother? Okay. Yes. All right. In, when when in are you going that, live with that? We're going to do that on Friday night at nine o'clock, I believe, Eastern Time. And in that show, I'm going to discuss who your best bet is for your money if you want to make some low cash because we have had a $100 winner um, in the Kentucky Derby once before. A horse of 55 to 1 came across the line and won and paid out $110 on a $2 bet. Sounds like a pretty good deal for me if I put $2 on a horse, win $110, and walk away happy. 
Um, so we'll talk about that as well. And a um, couple of things I did want to touch on before the Google Hangout was the the number one spot is the worst spot in my opinion for the gates. You got that you got that rail where twenty horses are I mean nineteen horses are just waiting to come down on you and you got you got nothing but the rail to the left and nineteen horses to the right. So it, it's a pretty tough spot to be in. Um and the horse that got there, Vickers in trouble. He was number two in the point standings for the Kentucky Derby. So he was a pretty good horse. And he has a female jockey who's never won the Kentucky Derby hundred and forty years of running it, a female has never won. So that's, a, that's another strike against them. And he's trying to become the first um, Louisiana-bred horse to win the Kentucky Derby. So that's another strike against them. It's 140 years of no Louisiana-bred horses winning the Kentucky Derby. So that's kind of my long shot that you throw out of your, you throw out of your picks, and then you're also going to throw out the 17 horse because nobody has ever won the Kentucky Derby from the number 17 spot. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I tell you what, man, uh, you know, knowing that me, I'm, I'm from the sportsman's paradise originally, a.k.a. Louisiana, man. So for that Louisiana bread horse, I'm pulling for you to go all the way <laughs> to be number one. <laughs> I wanted one more, and one more, one more little piece of information I wanted to let you know about. Uh, there is a guy, Calvin Bowrail, uh, he's from Louisiana. He's from New Orleans, I believe, and uh, okay. they call him, his name is Calvin Borel, B-O-R-E-L. They call him Borel because in the Kentucky Derby, he's won, I believe it's three Kentucky Derbies on horses that he should have never won with. But what he did was got to the rail, saved ground, and managed to maneuver in. In this race, he's number 19 out of 20, and it's going to take a long time for him to get to that rail from 19 horses away to get to the rail. Because he's, he's going to be wanting to get there. And they're uh, a bet online, I believe, on one of the websites, under on how long it takes him to get to the rail. Because that's all he does is go straight for the rail. No doubt, no doubt. No, I tell you what, man, I'm, I'm definitely going to be I've – been, I've been following your blogs on different races leading up to it and how everything stacks up. So I'm, I got educated. I'm ready. So I'll be looking forward to it, brother. And we'll also be looking forward to – the uh, Barbershop Sports Show, the Fresh Cut, a.k.a. the Google Hangout uh, uh, wing of, of our uh, program. So looking forward to that, brother. Uh, everybody out there, he's got blogs on barbershopsports.com. Check him out. He's Espo. You love him. Brooklyn's finest, man. We, we love you, brother. All right, man. Thanks. Have a good night, guys. No doubt, man. You too, brother. So, yeah, man. I mean, I tell you... It, <laughs> I never thought in a million years that I would be excited about the Kentucky Derby, man. But, uh, you know, hanging around all these experts, man, where, you know, they, <laughs> they're giving all of these great opinions and breaking things down. And, you know, I, I'm fired up, you know. Uh, Tide got me really, really even more fired up about hockey, you know, breaking it down from his from his perspective. b right and F-Bomb got me started. But uh, I think Tide, Tide brought it home, man. And, and, and this team, man, it's just, it's just great. Um Speaking of great, let's talk to LaMarcus Aldridge. Big Danny, one of our writers and holding it down here for Big Bucko, uh, has a blog on the NBA's next superstar. Uh, LaMarcus Aldridge has been sh- uh, slowly but surely getting his Andy Dufresne on, so to speak, and digging his way out into, you know, uh, the, the freedom, if you will, and, and freedom the way I break it down you know, emerging from the shadows and becoming a real bona fide star. You know, the Portland Trailblazers, man, I haven't been this excited about this team since Clyde the Glide was there. And watching LaMarcus Aldridge in his series against the Rockets is just a thing of beauty, especially games one and two where he just went absolutely ham sandwich. The shot was on. It just seemed like he could do no wrong, uh, but when he has the, the opportunity to go up against Dwight Howard uh, one-on-one, he, he showcases skills, and he is definitely, definitely one of the top big men in this league. Uh, Danny, let's talk a little bit about LaMarcus Aldridge and also this, this Rockets uh, uh, Trailblazers series where <laughs> Big Danny, 
you, we live here in Orlando. We were a part of Dwight Mayer Part 1. For all those fans in L.A., when they thought that they got the answer, the franchise, the future, and Dwight Howard, there was another Dwight Mayer. Now, the Portland Trailblazers have the Houston Rockets on the brink, and they brought Dwight Howard in to try to, you know, push for this championship. You got James Harden there, Chandler Parsons. They got some talent, but but it's not working out. So let's talk about that. First, first of all, let's talk about your thoughts on LaMarcus Aldridge. You know, quickly on LaMarcus, it's one of those things where he was in Portland, and the original plan was for him, Brandon Roy, and Greg Oden to be the you know, the big coming of the big three. You know, Roy and Odin had knee issues, never got to where they're supposed to be. So Aldridge was, you know, the last man in totem pole. And it took a while, you know, a bunch of rough years. The last couple of years he started to get recognized. And on this series against Houston, he's just literally destroying everything that Houston's put in front of him. He leads the playoffs and scoring at 35.3 points a game and averaging 11.5 rebounds. So he is making – you know, a complete mockery of the Rockets front line. So you have to give you have to give credit with credit to kind of the same way Steph Curry did last year the playoffs for Golden State. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. I mean he's definitely doing his thing. The Trailblazers look great, you know, I mean Damian Lillard was just a you know, a gift to this team here and and a a welcome boost after, you know, the Brandon Roy did not work out, unfortunately. And, you know, you got this team becoming a legitimate threat out in the West. And and these guys are young, so this is not the last that you're going to see of them, I I don't think, uh, no matter what happens in in the playoffs. But just speaking of the NBA playoffs as a whole, this first round, Danny, has got to be the most competitive, one of the most exciting in uh, first rounds that I can remember since I've been watching basketball. Now, we complain all the time about how soft this league is nowadays. You know, it's not as physical. You know, these guys are prima donnas. They complain all the time and whine. But the competition is here, man. I mean, Oklahoma City is struggling. You got San Antonio fighting with, with, with Dallas. You got Indiana Pacers looking like an eight seed and not the one seed. Atlanta is, you know... <laughs> found new life. So let's let's talk about your thoughts on what you have seen being, you you know, you're an NBA guy, man. What's your thoughts on the first round of the playoffs? You know, watching the first round of the playoffs, you know, with the exception of the majority of the Bobcats and Heat series, it's been very entertaining. I I think there hasn't been a night in the playoffs without at least one overtime game or game coming down to the very end, you know, even tonight's game with Toronto and, and Brooklyn going down to the wire at the Raptors, we were almost a, it was a 25-point lead in this game. They were you know, blowing out the Nets, and the Nets came back, and you know, they fell short. But I don't think there hasn't been a night where it hasn't been something entertaining. You know, we go through these production calls all the time, and you know, I always say the NBA playoffs this year is even more exciting than the NHL playoffs, and I, I can't, you can't argue against it this year. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it, man. I'm loving it. Um, you know, but, but Indiana, brother, you, you got to help me out. Buckle is not here. Help, you know, help me out with Indiana, brother. You know, real quickly, it, it just looks like you know, Frank Vogel's lost the team. You know, now in Game Five, you really couldn't help the fact of Mike Scott going five for five from the three point line in the second quarter. You know, I think they scored 41 points in the second, and they were just obliterating Indiana at home. Because, honestly, I thought Indiana was going to, you know, to, to blow out Atlanta in game five. So it's now pretty much do or die for Indiana. If I think if Indiana loses this game, Indiana might be looking for a new head coach. Yeah, yeah, because he, he looks like he's, he's completely lost control of, 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 you know, the team. You know, he's the timeouts, you know, he's fussing and nobody's looking at what, what he's <laughs> talking about. It's like, okay, you know, where he looked at it to be a, a young, promising uh, uh, coach in this league, now he's looking like, you know, Lawrence Frank, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And we all kind of know how Lawrence Frank started out with the New Jersey Nets, and now, you know, he's been riding the bench everywhere he goes ever since. Um, what about 
this uh, OKC Memphis Grizzlies matchup? Well, you know, you look at the controversy of last night with the Joey Crawford incident and kept the kept with um, those who didn't uh, watch the game last night. Long story short, Durant got to the free throw line with about 27 seconds left of the game, uh, two shot free throws. He makes the first one. Crawford gives him the ball. Durant goes into his routine, and then Crawford takes the ball. They go to the scores table. Durant misses the free throw. Oklahoma City loses by a point. You know, Oklahoma City has not played like they should have been in the series, but Memphis – is not your typical seven seed either. Memphis is a team that got to the conference finals last year. You know, they have Zach Randolph, they have Marcus All, they have the emerging Mike Conley. You know, Mike Miller actually playing this year. He's hitting threes, Courtney Lee, Jared Bayless. They have a very, very solid team, you know, and it's it's a it's a terrible matchup for for, for Oklahoma City because they have guys who can guard Kevin Durant. Tony Allen has played brilliantly on Durant in the series. And that's been the big key, you know, the defense on Durant. Yeah, 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 you know. And, and you know, Zach Randolph and Marcus all, you know, also attack places in, in Oklahoma City's, you know, defense that they're deficient in. So, yeah, man, I mean, it's been, been very, very competitive. And shout out to, to Vince Carter with, with the, the game-winning last-second shot. The Mavericks, you know, I thought San Antonio was going to go through them like a hot knife through butter, but uh, they're playing with some heart. So I, I definitely want to give a shout out to 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 the Mavericks for you know playing very very competitive. Uh, there's some breaking news that just happened a little earlier uh, during the show that um, Mike D'Antoni has resigned as head coach of the Lakers. Um, yeah. Where do you think the Lakers go next, man? Well. Um, that's Magic Johnson. I think he's had, had the best week ever. Um, he tweeted out, you know, how it's the old happy day song being played in L.A. Um, I think the Lakers in the situation, we all knew this was coming. Um, even though people say he was going to stay, we knew the Tony wasn't going to last. Now the question is, who do you go after? Is it do you try to attract Kevin Ollie from, uh, from UConn? Uh, do you go for one of these coaches who can be fired? If Mark Jackson doesn't somehow survive in Golden State, do you go after him? If Frank Vogel's out there, do you go after him? But honestly, there's a name out there that Laker fans might not know. Actually, Laker fans should know. Uh, Ettore Zuri, if I can pronounce his name right, he's the coach from Italy. Uh, could be the first, you know, international head coach. Uh, served on Mike Brown's staff, I think, two years ago when he was part of the team. And he's a very, very well-respected coach. Probably one of the best winners in Europe. So he could be the dark horse to take the Lakers head coaching job if they don't go for a big time head coach now. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, well I mean that they're definitely in a in a rebuilding phase, so you know it, it's not a whole lot of I mean it's a pressure because it's LA, you know, and you know you got Kobe coming back uh next year and obviously he's gonna wanna fight to win. Um so yeah, I mean but, you know, you had D'Antoni there, man. You know, did anybody think that was going to be successful? I didn't. You know, the Knicks wasn't successful. Why would DBC, you know, Phoenix wasn't successful. So why would you hand them the keys to the Corvette, man? I mean, they got a lot of good coaches in this league sitting on benches, you know, over there in Tom Thibodeau's ranks. And like you say, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with Mark Jackson and, and, and Frank Vogel. I don't even know why we're talking about what's going to happen with Mark Jackson with his team playing the way they've been playing, but uh, it's still out there uh, like that. But, of course, there there are other guys that are waiting in the wings as well. So, uh, interesting. We'll, we'll keep our eye on that. But, yeah, that is breaking news. Now, we, you know, once again, the NBA playoffs, fantastic. San Antonio is taking a 3-2 to lead over the Mavericks. You got uh, the Nets and in, in the in the in the Raptors there fighting 115-113. Toronto take a 3-2 lead there, and the Rockets and Trailblazers are going at it as well. Uh, now, you know this this episode is is, is labeled intolerance, and we got to talk about intolerance a little bit, man. Let's let's talk about a man who has become the new Pete Rose in fact of being banned for life. 
Donald Sterling, due to these, these, these asinine, repugnant comments that he obviously clearly, when you listen to the audio uh, of, of the phone call, was baited into uh, saying it turned into a crap storm that could not be appeased. It was getting out of control. The sponsors were pulling out uh, of L.A. for as the Clippers are concerned. Uh, you, you had players in disarray, the, the coaches, everybody being asked questions about this, these racist comments that he had made in, in, in reference to associating with African Americans and things of that nature to, you know, where you're not talking about basketball anymore. You, you're supposed to be pushing for a, a Western Conference championship and competing for an NBA title, but you're be, a, being asked questions about what do you think about your te the team owner's views on race. And, you know, it's just an unfortunate mess. Um, I have a blog up on, on Donald Sterling uh, about society's underbelly, and Big Ted has an article up on, on the divisions in our country that unfortunately still exist. Yes, the NBA did run a, a, a number about we are one, and, and whereas we all want to believe that, Whereas we all want to, you know, understand that uh, and think and, and, and that we live in a world where we're judged by our merits, our character, and not, you know, our ethnicity. Unfortunately, we we do live in a world where that happens. Uh, now, the thoughts are mixed as far as the punishment goes, because you know, saying racist things is not against the law, but even though. That being the case, the NBA is an entity. They have bylaws and things that govern them and things that you can't do. And the bottom line is Donald Sterling was bad for business. So, Big Ted, you know, your thoughts when you heard that Donald Sterling was banned for life? What, what, what was your thoughts? Or better yet, you know what, Danny, what was your thoughts on it? Well, you know, at first when I first saw it, first heard the video and I was wondering what Adam Silver was going to come up with, you know, and what could you possibly do, you know, that David Stern couldn't do. And when he made that announcement, I wanted to stand up and cheer because Adam Silver did everything he could in this situation. I mean, he's going to push the owners to force him out. He's going to, you know, he, fought, he fought him the maximum, pretty much banned the guy from life and from anything basketball related, you know, it's a sad day to see an owner leave, but it was something, as the old saying goes, the chickens come to roost, and this has been going on for years, and they've swept it under the rug, and now it's it's out in the open. And I couldn't be more prouder of the NBA than, you know, what Adam Silver's done, and because if he did nothing, I can only imagine what would have happened at Staples Center last night. If nothing would have been done, so I'm yeah. pleased. I'm very happy. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we have a, a good friend of ours, waiting in the wings and he was he was waiting a little earlier. Uh Mr. Eric Kohler of uh the Eric Kohler show on on C B S. Eric man, thanks for holding my friend. Hey man, what's going on man? You got a popular show, man. I like your style. Oh man, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. Just trying to just trying to be like you, my big brother in sports, man. What's going on? Hey man, I'm chilling man. I just I moved to uh Fox Sports affiliate now. I got uh Okay. EK Sports. I was with 15 months. I was with CBS Sports Affiliate, but uh, they approached me to move my show over, and it gave me some more exposure, all the stuff I do with UCF, and and uh, I thought it was a great opportunity. But I just uh, I saw your text and all that stuff, and I want to get in line. But, uh, man, it's great to hear you got such a good uh, call-in volume. Congratulations, Hezzy. Uh, I appreciate it. That means a lot coming from you, my friend. Uh, so how have things been going since you've been over at Fox Sports? No, no, I think it's been good, man. You know, a lot of exposure. You know, a lot of exposure. The flagship station, the UCF, and uh, you know, I thought it was the right fit with synergy and all that good jazz and stuff. But I mean, I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, I know you were talking about the Kentucky Derby. I, I kind of laughed when you said, like, "Hey, you know, I'm not a big Kentucky Derby guy with the experts, so it makes me get excited." And hey, those are the benefits as you of having your own show because now you'll get excited about sports or certain events that. You never got excited about maybe years ago before your show, so I, 
So kudos to you on that. Yeah, I appreciate it, uh, Eric. Now, we're sitting here talking about Donald Sterling and, and the recent events that happened with him being banned for life and fined $2.5 million. Uh, while, while we have you here, my friend, what were your thoughts on that when you heard that news? Well, I mean, I mean, first of all, you know, it's kind of crazy. You know, he's with a girlfriend that uh, is recording their conversations, whatever that, you know, whatever that entails. And the things he said, you know, obviously, you know, rub a lot of people wrong, and, and, and they were wrong. I mean, he should not be an NBA owner. But, you know, the crazy thing, I think, as a sidebar is you have all these people that have lined up to say, hey, we're going to buy the Clippers and all this good jazz, has he? But, hey, you know what, this guy – Nevertheless, his thoughts or thinkings that are, are wrong in this day's society, you know what? I, there, there's no guarantee the Clippers are going to be for sale. I mean, there, there's going to be a lot more process, a lot more to this story than, you know, him going away because he is a litigator. He's a guy that's been in court before, and if you read the report, has he, he's had troubles with this before. This is not the first run-in. It's just the comments that he had mentioned were – very offensive to everybody around because, you know, our country is, is a melting pot now. So with that, that is wrong. But I just think on a sidebar story, Hezzy, is the fact that all these people are trying to line up to buy the Clippers that really is not officially for sale yet. And <laughs> I, I think that he's – seriously, I think it's kind of funny that, you know, you've got Oprah Winfrey, you've got Floyd Weather, you know, Mayweather and all these people that want to buy the Clippers. And it, that's not a guarantee. So I think he's going to go down kicking. In my opinion, I really do. I think it's going to be more than the story than it is. And the bottom line is, you know, kudos to, to Silver, the NBA commish, you know, coming down, you know, saying, hey, you know, you can't, you can't be this way in, in this in this time and day. And, and it was, you know, it was accepted all the way across the board. I mean, the players, owners, everybody that enjoys the NBA and, and in our society of America, it was the right thing to do. But I'll tell you one on a sidebar, I do not believe this story is going to go away. You think that the guy that – He's going to feel like all, he's got nothing to lose. He's eight years old, and I, I think he's going to fight it. It's not going to go away, and I think it's going to be crazy to watch how this unfolds, in my honest opinion. Yeah. Hey, yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. Go ahead, Ted. Hey, Eric, how you doing? This is Ted. Um, listen, hey, Ted, uh, how are you? Pretty good. Just to add on to that, this guy's a billionaire, so you're, yes, you're definitely correct. He's, he's not going away. I that's mean, it, it's it, it's not a slam dunk. It's I mean, it was something that I was thinking as we were we were watching it on the web the other day, um, yesterday, and I said, "This is nothing to celebrate." You know, I mean, there's, there's 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 so many other issues that that are happening right now, and you know, you read your 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 Twitter streamline, and it says, "Oh, you know, he hit a grand slam. He did this. He did that." I'm like, "No, you didn't." It, there's yep. a much bigger problem now because now you kind of put the rest of these other owners have opened up something. I mean, you don't want to say it's a Pandora's box, and it's not just for the owners. Players, too. I mean, this is going to be full-blown. You know, I, I'm not sure of the date of the next CBA or, or you know, yes, they, you know, the, the, the new slogan, we are one, but I think just as you said, he's not going away. This story's not going away, and the fact of the matter is, you got the wife, you got the girlfriend, you got the recording. I mean, it's just really odd. It, it really is, and Ted, that, it's a very good question. Again, it's like you know everything that he has done or said is is, is offensive to everybody, and, and I agree with the decision. I think that's fantastic. But the fact is, when you've had that much, you're in a power of influence that, unfortunately, right now, guys, laughable is that. We're not in that spot right now to think that we're worth billions on our asset sheet, okay? We don't have that. But, man, he, the power influence, whether or not he's liked within his community, he's one of the big boys and one of the elite that controls so many things. And it's, it, it's, it's really going to be a crazy drama storyline. It really is because, you know, everyone can applaud it, and, and I applaud it as well. I mean, that, there's no reason in sports. I mean, the one thing I will think is this, is that, hey, Everyone has beliefs and thoughts, okay? The First Amendment and speech, freedom of speech, that is America. That's why every other country envies us, okay? I, I get that. But the fact is, you never, in a power of influence position, you can't think these ways of thoughts that were 150 to 200 years back. I mean, that's why he needs to be stripped of his NBA ownership. 
But the same token, this is a big fish. If you ever watched the movie Wall Street, this guy is a whale. Nevertheless, yes. people like him or what have you, he is a whale. He has a lot of weight. He can throw around the courtroom as a litigator. He knows people, power of influence. You don't have to like him because he's so big, he's above the circle. You don't have to have the friends. And I think it's laughable. I did, my, my, again, to reiterate something, not to beat the dead horse, and Ted, you hit it back there on the point there, is that, you know, people think, oh, they're lining up to buy the Clippers. Like, it's going to be an auction sale on the courthouse steps. Not so fast, my friend. This is going to be a story that's going to unfold, and it's going to be bizarre. And, and as you said before, Ted, about the owners that are going to have to vote on this, you know, they're going to have right. a lot of pressure of, you know, voting in favor of Silver's decision, which I think they will. But the same token is you can vote 29 to nothing because obviously Silver, uh, obviously uh, the owner of the Clippers, he doesn't have a vote now. But right. you know what? In the courts, hey, if he takes that litigation and appeals it and says, hey, his freedom of speech was violated, Think about that as an angle for your sports show. I mean, mm-hmm. think about, like, he, these recordings, he never said this in a public forum. He wasn't in downtown Los Angeles at a pep rally for the Clippers. I mean, this, even though as warped it as is with his 31-year-old girlfriend and said it was okay, honey, to record me, he could be like, hey, you know what? My freedom of speech has been violated, and therefore I feel like I am the victim. So how about that for a wrinkle? Yeah, I mean, seriously, for yeah. sports talk debate, how about that for a wrinkle? Because, hey, man, if you, I, I mean, again, we don't know, you know, what that's like to have that much money and that influence. But, you know, mm-hmm. when someone has pushed the fact, they're not going to go away. They're going to be not going to be like, hey, here's a $100 gift card. Go to Applebee's and go away. This is going to be, <laughs> this guy has been around a long time, oh, he's yeah. 80 years <laughs> old, guys. And you know what? This is always going to leave on. He's has an estranged wife. I've read the whole storyline. And now he's got a 31-year-old girlfriend. It, it's a bizarre scenario. And I just, you know, it's she he, she blackmailed him, and then she acted like she got pissed. It, it's really right. a bizarre twist. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, there's so many different different angles that it can be taken. There's also the angle of the players wanting the, the, the voters, uh, the NBA owners' votes to be public. And the NBA owners, you know, saying, "Hey, we want our votes to be anonymous," uh, right. and it could be know. private, it, exactly. With with the bylaws of the NBA, it it you know it could be very real private, and that's what's supposed to be. It doesn't have to be public forum. It could be private. But I mean, guys, think about it. I mean, maybe I'm giving you a different twist or something you've already thought about. But the angle of that you you, you got to be with me. And the guy's a whale. He's got influence. He's a big hitter in the Los Angeles area. Forget the fact of whether you like him and his comments are, you know, as offensive as they are. But in the big picture, if the guy wants to fight it, I think the guy's a very crafty guy. He could really, really turn this around, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. They're there for a long fight. <laughs> hey, mm-hmm. Hezzy, Hezzy and, 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 and Eric, he is Gordon Gecko. Without a doubt. He really... <laughs> <laughs> he is Gordon Gecko. He really is. And, and I tell you what, that airline that they try to sell underneath the record of the SEC rules, that, that's, that's, that's the great storyline with, with Gecko. And I, I tell you, I, I, just, I just think it's not going to go away. And, again, I think it was a great decision, you know, to be banned for life and all that good stuff. And it's like, you know, the next thing is, I, you know, I hope everybody for the fact is, is in society, and I'll let you guys get back to your show, but the bottom line is this, is that we can talk it to death, but I want to move on to the fact that there's a lot of good NBA stuff going on, and we shouldn't put on the fact that this guy made some bad comments, you know, and, and really bad comments, okay? That doesn't reflect society. I mean, in my little circle of influence, your guys' circle of influence, that's never even a thought. But we're here to get along. We're all on the same big blue earth that's spinning around, and I don't want to put more thought in it because the more you think about it, you overthink it, and then we have other problems. I just think the fact this is an isolated incident, let's get rid of the guy, take care of it, move on, life is pretty good, and let's enjoy these wonderful NBA playoffs. Absolutely. You know, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. We shouldn't be talking about this because the the, the first round has been absolutely amazing. Uh there's a there's a lot of parody, a lot of a lot of competition and and unfortunately this, you know, story 
is dominating dominating the headlines. But uh, we will, we will get back to basketball, I believe, Eric. Uh, now that that you know Adam Silver has made the decision, and we can kind of start to pick up the pieces and and, and move forward. Uh, well, you know, this this country and the people in this country are usually good about that. Um, Eric, before you get out of here, my friend, let everybody know where they can catch your show, brother. Hey, man, I appreciate it, man. I'm on uh, 7 4 of the game. It's a Fox Sports affiliate. Uh, it's from 11 a.m. to noon every Saturday. It's a weekend sports report. And you can obviously email me at EK Sports underscore radio and like me at EK Sports. And I appreciate the love, guys. I really appreciate you guys. And and uh, you guys do a great job. I really do. I think it's fantastic. I was listening. You got a great callership. So all your listeners out there that, that support your show, keep doing it. Because, Hezzy, you got a great product. And, Ted, you bring a lot of things as well, man. You guys got a good thing going. I'll let you go. Thanks so much for your time. Good luck. To you. Absolutely. I appreciate care, you, too, Eric. Man. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Hezzy. Take care. Thank you. You too, brother. Do you know Gianni Russo? He has been in many movies that you may know and love, such as The Godfather, as Carlo Rizzi, Don Corleone's wife beating Double Crossing's son-in-law, and he's been in another 40 movies or so. I could go on and on, but you just gotta go.